This panel is, is focused on, on authenticity and, and what it means, uh, what the approach to authentic travel is in Asia. Uh, so I am going to be joined by three people who have a lot of experience in that area. Um, the first uh, is Lolik Peng. He's the um, founder and director of the Unlisted Coll Collection. Welcome. Uh, and the second is Andreas Kohn, who's uh, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at the Cap Capella Hotel Group in Singapore. The third is Eddie Tay, who's General Manager of uh, Belmont Hotel and Cruises. My first question is, is really about this term, authentic travel. It's, it's extremely popular in travel marketing now. Um, people are offering sort of big bulk tours and calling them authentic. Uh, the three of you have uh, different brands, and I just wanted you to define what it really means for your brand. How do you present authentic luxury, so to speak, uh, to, to your guests? Um, and why don't we start with, with you, Lil? I think for me, you know, uh, authenticity comes on many levels. I mean, our type of hotels really focus on heritage buildings. We are usually in neighborhoods that are where the locals hang out, you know. So if you look at uh, where we are around the world, whether we are in, in Shanghai in the South Bund or London in, in Bethnal Green, we want our guests to go out and kind of mingle with the community to do activities that the community that might might do and to live in buildings that are kind of landmarks in the in the in the area you know so for us we focus really on that part of the experience for our guests and what we deem to be authentic to that city to that location um, and and I think that kind of resonates very well with the, with the type of traveler who does stay with us okay. what about you Andreas um, for me personally I think uh, people stand at the forefront when it comes to authenticity because if you create an experience that is authentic to a destination, authentic to a culture, you need to have um, very well-trained staff, again, people, um, who are taking the guests on, on the journey to make it authentic. You know? So I think it's really a combination of you know, the destination, um, the culture in the destination, and, and the people who live in the destination. Yeah. Well, I think authenticity is a word that's quite cliche and it's quite, you know, it's used frequently. And Belmont, you know, we, we have small properties around the world. Uh, and our focus mainly is part of being with the local. And I think that uh, creating experiences that sort of people could be immersed into it and really feel it. It's the old key of, uh, of our old values of my company. Uh, uh, similar thing when the, uh, well, I run Belmont in Myanmar. And obviously, it's not very difficult to create adventures, interesting experiences in, in Myanmar because it is very authentic as it is. Uh, and obviously, the challenge is then to make sure that people are totally immersed into it and as, uh, as, as it is. And I think that. The biggest challenge uh, in, in some cases is, is the, the mobile phones and picture taking. But uh, the, the true fact is that if you could get people totally involved in it, that's when uh, you know that uh, you created something very low and very uh, special. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is a challenge, though, in having uh, uh, structured, very structured itineraries yeah. that do feel real, though, right? Because you're, you're offering the same thing. It might be to a limited clientele, um, but it, it is sort of, uh, you know, people experience history in one city. It might be uh, presented in a similar way that history is presented in a different city. So, so how do you get beyond that? How do you get beyond the, the sort of very structured, organized itinerary that you have to have to, to satisfy the traveler and, and make them sort of forget that that structure is in place? That's a question for anybody. I think, I think inevitably, you know, when you, you, as a traveler, turn up at a city and you've got three days and you want to get in as much as you can and you're in somewhere like 
Myanmar, where, where there's, a, you know, there's a million temples to go to. Literally, you go to Bagan and they have a city of a thousand temples. Right? How do you fill all those things in three days? And I think as a modern traveler, look, you know, you've got to make a choice that's right for yourself. Do you want to go on these tours where they, you spend five minutes at each location and someone gives you a potted version of the history of that place? Or do you kind of want to, to kind of try and find something that you spend you know, four hours at one place? You don't get to see everything in the city. You, know, you go spend four hours with a, with a personalized guide. Um, it will probably cost you more than that three-day tour. You know? uh, and you have a meal with a family or, or a restaurant that locals go to. Those are the type of experience I prefer. Um, and then I'll come back another day and see the, the thing that I miss in that city. And for me, that's much more important. But that's a choice travelers make. And some uh, you know, people, this Instagram generation, perhaps they want to see every landmark in the space of three days, take the photographs, post it, and let all their friends know that they've been to every landmark in the city. But they've barely scratched the surface. You know? So I think it, it really depends on, on what you want to achieve. Um, and there are many, many people uh, who want to achieve different things, and, and that's okay. But personally, for me, I, I like to go to a place and spend lots of time uh, trying to learn one aspect of, of uh, a travel experience. And if there's something that intrigues me, I'll come back. I think it's really the, the, the art of travel, in a way. Um, how you, as a, as a supplier in the luxury space, are able to, to embrace this. So in other words, at, one, at what point do you connect with your guest, maybe prior arrival, and, and we do this at Capella through our personal assistance um, uh, system, and then really make sure that whatever messages is being received doesn't come across as too scripted in response. So what I personally really do not like is when I travel with my family is, um, we'd like to do a city tour, and then you get you know, recommended a bus company to, with no disrespect, hop on, hop off, whatever. So you get something that is scripted by somebody for everybody, and that to me is losing authenticity to a very large extent. You know, I would like to, to be able to share what I would like to see in that destination and how I would like to see it, depending on who I'm with, um, and, and, and really make, make that experience genuine and, and authentic as, as much as possible. And I think what you said, Lo, it's not about seeing in our space, I think, seeing about as much as possible in the time you have. Um, I would agree with you, and we would always recommend this, you know, take quality time and go to one place and absorb that culture, that, that heritage, that history of that place, um, and then share that among yourself, not necessarily on Instagram. You can do this when you're back <laughs> home. Um, but, but share that and, and, and talk about that experience. And this is, I think, when, when you as a, as a supplier, um, you know, different yourself uh, from, from the masses and from the others. I mean, we at Belmont, and in, you know, I talk a lot about Myanmar, I spent a bit of time in. Uh, we spent 20 years there, and that sort of gives us the age of uh, understanding what's, what we can deliver. Uh, in the last two years, we have changed around the way we do our itineraries. We work towards customizing it. And I believe that when you travel, you know, we have so many different type of customers and different needs. But it's not only that, it's not from different levels of luxurious, even that you break it down to generations, multi-generation travels, family travels together. But you can never please uh, all. You know, like uh, Lo says, you have three days, how do you please all? So the only way that we could do it is that we come out with a very customized itinerary that we test it out to different generations of groups of people, different needs. So we would create ones that are for adventurers, the ones who prefer to just tick the boxes and you know, do the surface and share it on Instagram and been there, done that. And then there's ones that really like to you know, get their hands into it. And that's what we're good at, is, is actually get you so involved in it that you don't have time to take photographs. You have time to actually experience it. And by doing so, you know, if you travel with a family of different ages, or people come together, especially on our cruise, like you know, Road to Mandalay, where we had three nights and four night cruises, you know, at the end of the day, you would see that a family actually have a lot more to share with each other on the dinner table, because each of them had the choices of what they want to experience and what they like to do. Because everybody, uh, not only from uh, specific groups or, or, or savvy travelers, they have different age and different needs. And if you cater for all that at one go, 
you will find that you actually cover all the necessary uh, experiences needed. And people do walk away with a lot happier family and have a great time. So um, how honest, though, are people about what they want to do? I mean, I could imagine someone saying, yeah, I really want to immerse myself in this culture, experience it, and then once they're there, they do not put their phone away and do take a bunch of pictures for Instagram. I'm one of those people. Um, so, <laughs> so how do you deal with that? I mean, I, and recently we, we tried it out this. We took a group of people, you know, savvy travelers, uh, travel agents around the world. We flew them to Myanmar, uh, spent a great time at Governor's Residence in Yangon, you know, two, three nights seeing the cities is developing quickly, and then take them quickly to Road to Mandalay. And what we did, was instead of taking them to temples, and Lo said there's a lot of temples to see, and there, there are some amazing that you want to show them. But the, the most popular ones are the ones that we took them to a village, and we did a rally quickly, you know, uh, and come out with four or five things that, the daily things that people do in the village, the, the, the life of the villages, and what do they actually do, and creating this little uh, exercise and challenges that they have to do. So we have people you know, traveling on a horse car and ox cars, and they call it the um, sort of a local made engine toot toots. And they will be on those going from one challenge to another. In the beginning, most of the, you know, there are two fronts, ones that takes a lot of photos, and the ones that are quite, oh, really, I mean, I like authenticity, but, you know, really, is that safe? <laughs> you know, I'm really, my hands, oh, God, is that water safe? You know, second, second uh, stops, you find that people totally forget, and they are so involved in it. The local comes in, surrounded by them, cheer them on, and they do chores that are very simple, you know, sort of carrying water, as you would do in the village from the, from the river, and the wealth to your home. And so we do a bit of exercise of CSR on it, where people have, you know, the more water you collect, then the money will be donated to the family of that to buy a pump, uh, you know, making churrits, you know. And, and it's small little exercise, but you're keeping their hands so busy that they don't have time to take photographs. But the, I, the trick is this, you must tell them there's someone else taking photograph of you. It's all captured. <laughs> live videos and all that, and you, you will have all of that at the end of the day to share it. So, uh, and that's how I think that people forget about it. And by the time they, at the end of the whole trip, that's what they remember. They go away with something here, thinking, wow, that is such amazing uh, experiences. One of the challenges I, I find in, in today's world is that our customers, our guests, are obviously a lot more sophisticated and educated about the destination prior actually going on the journey. Um, so you, you, you have this experience where, where they sit in front of our PAs and, and they know or they think they know a lot more about Singapore or Shanghai or Ubud and Bali um, uh, than, than we do who, who live there who operate a business there and then to find that, that, that inside path where the guest said hmm I have not read about that in Lonely Planet or wherever. Tell me more about this. I think then you are on a path of success, of creating an experience that is truly, truly genuine. So really finding that, that inside path and um, you know, the moment you, you say, oh yeah, um, you, I, I know about what you say, I can tell you where that is and how to get there, then you are not creating something unique. You're just picking up something that the guest already has in their mind. Um, and I think once then that, that trip that you ex um, just described, uh, Eddie, uh, which is definitely not something I think a lot of guests would read about before they come, you know, is what we need to focus on more. You know, to really find something that nobody has done before and has written about to make it special. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually agree with, with uh, both the other speakers. Obviously, you know, an experience, an authentic experience for each person is a, is a very personal thing, you know. And, and I don't presume to try and tell someone what, what I think they should be doing in, a, in an authentic manner wherever they go. You know, I think I go to city, I have my own agenda. You know, what I get out of it is very personal. Uh, of course, I take lots of photographs when I do it too. I post on Instagram the things that are particularly interesting. Other things I share with my friends personally. Um, so these things are just, they're all authentic, you know. When you come to somewhere like Asia where, you know, within, within a three-hour flight of Singapore, you have, you know, hundreds of different cultures and different destinations and you get to, you know, wh how do you choose where to go if you're flying all the way from Europe 
you've made this 15, uh, 20 hour journey if you're coming from the States. You know, so for each of our guests, we try and make sure that they have a ability to kind of tap into what they really want to do. We, I, we don't try and steer them in a certain way. Each person who comes here has a different version of what he wants to do. His own version of what an authentic Asia is, you know. Whether it's Thailand, you know, with, the, with, the, with their campaign about the smiles or, or authentic Malaysia or whatever it is, right? Um, everyone comes away with a different um, um, agenda and that, that's totally fine. You know, each of us in the travel industry tries to cater to an individual need. We're, we're not in the mass tourism game anymore. I think those, those days are largely gone, you know. Obviously, there's still a, a market for the mass tourism. I think the early, early travelers from India and all that, they want to see everything on a package tour because it's convenient and they're afraid of, of, of kind of uh, uh, trying to navigate the system themselves. But once you get to travelers who have done this three or four times, they have their own version of what they want to do in an authentic manner. And you know, all of us in the travel industry, I think, would make a mistake if we, we, we make any presumptions about what those things might be. Um, so you're, you're all saying sort of similar things. You, know, you, you, you basically listen to the traveler. Um, and you sort of try to push them, though, to, to maybe get beyond what they think is, is safe. I mean, not so aggressively that they come away unsatisfied. Um, is there, uh, and a lot of this means that you have to provide excellent service, of course. Uh, and so how do you, prov you know, give access to local culture and, and yet sort of have it be filtered enough so that the, the luxury traveler really enjoys themselves? Um, one example is we actually, the Times read it, ran a story today um, describing, you know, an American tourist being led around Uganda, I think, and, uh, you know, the tour guide it felt like having a big stature was was really good and said, oh, yay, you know, you're packing in the pounds because that's a compliment <laughs> there. And the American <laughs> tourists came away pretty unhappy about that. So um, how do you, you know, have cultural exchange and yet make, um, you know, your customers happy? You have to, um, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, you have to embrace the, the, the destination where you operate. And I'd like to give an example. Um, we are currently having um, our Capella Ubud in Bali under construction. And that is not um, you know, a, a regular, I should say, with no disrespect, um, villa resort in Ubud. It's a tented camp in a small village outside of Ubud called Kiliki. And the only way our owner um, was able to to acquire the land and start building these 22 tented villas is by embracing the local culture in that part of Ubud. So in other words, you know, uh, there's almost like a quota of how many uh, local staff you, you are required to hire. Um, you're buying a certain amount of local produce uh, from, from the markets in, in that village. And you then create your experiences, you know, together with, with um, with the, yeah, with the inhabitants of, of that part of, of the destination, so to speak. And if you translate that into an experience, i.e., you know, not your regular, um, the chef takes you to the market, you buy the food, and then you cook it in the restaurant. I mean, we've often been doing this for, for ages. It's more about um, doing that together with a local and maybe then cook that food in their home if that's appropriate. So, you know, really moving that experience to, to the next level of what we currently know um, and, and give it a very, very authentic uh, kick to it. Yeah. I, think, I think for me, you know, there, there's multiple facets to this, but in, in, in the large developed cities in Asia like Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Jakarta, uh, Kuala Lumpur, in, in a sense, it's easier for the, for the international traveler, the luxury traveler, to get an authentic experience because these are, you know, the, the, the inhabitants of these cities are, in a sense, closer to, to the level of lifestyle that they enjoy in their home countries. And, but when you get to, you know, in, in, in Asia particularly, we are very conscious of it. There's a very large disparity of wealth between the poorer regions and the built-up urban regions. And you get into this danger of, you know, poverty porn sort of thing where you're touring villages and you're trying to authenticate an experience which, in a sense, will never be authentic to the person who comes from New York or, or London. And so I think we in the travel industry have to be very, very careful about how we manage those things and how you introduce uh, uh, someone who's coming from uh, a totally different background, totally, totally different lifestyle, and you bring him to a, a village in a poor part of Indonesia or, or, to, or Myanmar, 
Um, and how do you how do you make that first of all palatable to him, and and also palatable to the local inhabitants? So you know, for for me, I'm always very conscious um, that sometimes these tours, where you go to villages and you're partaking in certain activities, it, it can come across as trite, you know, a little bit condescending. You're like, oh, I'm going to spend half a day uh, planting crops with this person, <laughs> and then you disappear to your luxury suite. You know, is that authentic <laughs> travel experience? I I don't think so. So you know. When you are in a, in, a, in a nice resort somewhere in Laos and you're largely isolated, you do pick up um, elements of the culture in that place, you know, whether it's the temples or the locals that are going about their, their daily lives. But, you know, to, to urban people, those type of experiences perhaps will never be truly authentic and we shouldn't try and kid ourselves and, you know, try and do these tours sometimes. So I, I, I think I, we have to be very careful when we when we as, as um, because we, are res we have to be responsible stakeholders, how we plan these things for our guests, not to make it into, in a sense, something that is artificial, really kind of artificial, but packaged in an authentic manner. I think we should, we should not be afraid of, um, you know, of, uh, no, we should not walk away from challenges, that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. in, the, in the areas we, we operate. So I, I agree with you, Law, that makes sense. Um, but, you know, it is part of Myanmar, it is part of other destinations where there is a certain, you know, um, you know, level of poverty that is, that is eminent. Everybody can see it. Yeah? And I think at the moment we try to um, hide that from our clients, we are no longer genuine, nor are we authentic. It is just a way how to, how to involve that. Um, and, and I think there are many great examples where um, hotel operators have embraced challenges of a community um, and involve the community in addressing these challenges. You mentioned that, that example with the water pump earlier, yeah, something and, around and these lines. Yeah, I think it's so important that uh, the community is aware of the guests that are coming. Yeah. Uh, it's important to customize all your itineraries to tailor it for the community, not only just for mm -hmm. the tourists. It's also important to be very, like Lo say, careful not to create something like a show. At the end of the day, you created a false economy to the villages, and they have uh, had expectation that probably would then turn into something too commercial, and you actually destroy the, you know, the whole uh, point of what we were trying to do. It's the responsibility of tourism you know, is a word that's used quite frequently, but I think the best way to achieve this is to involve the community to customize the experiences that you were will be delivering to the community as well as to the guests. Because at the end of the day, if you do have this balance where the community finds fun and excitement and you know, hopefully earn something out of it and, and or not, the, the thing that most people would love to have is that the both sides uh, share the common uh, experience and actually walk away happy meeting each other and, and that they don't feel that they are uh, uh, so sort of uh, propped up uh, uh, visit show. Yeah. So how do you, in that case, do you, you, how do you identify the community need? Do you go to them and just say, hey, you know, we're, we're developing here, we're, we're developing itineraries, um, what do you need and how, what could our guests provide? How does that happen? I think that, that one of the most uh, interesting part of my role being a hotelier and also work uh, in a cruise that provides hotel facilities that our crews traveled a long distance, you know, to 1,500 miles up to a very remote places. But in order for you, you know, bringing a big ship and then sort of bird near a small village is very daunting for the villagers as well. And it, as Lo said, it is not pleasant to see that you have a luxurious boat and then you bird next to a house that is very poor. Uh, what we do is that we have a ground logistics uh, consists of 60 to 80 staff that works into two trips and they follow the ships. And we work a uh, recce, we call it, way ahead of each cruise to make sure that the community is aware that we're coming and they are comfortable that we will be there. Uh, but the nicest thing to do is that because roads facilities and access are quite difficult, we would then ask the, the, the community, is there any things they need that we can bring by using the ship because it's a lot easier. So in most cases, uh, we created projects that we could finish and complete for that particular cruise in digging a well, 
uh, building a school quick, uh, water tanks, it, you know, it's, it's very, very uh, popular and I, I find it very uh, you, uh, helping the community a lot. And this is what we do, we go from one village to another to make sure they're comfortable. And from there, the guests would then be welcome uh, because, you know, it's sort of expected. But, you know, people are generally very warm and I think the experience is always both sides, the guests as well as the villagers, you know, to see, you know, meet different people. And I think that is something that is very, you know, uh, typical for Asia. I think it's a lot easier to um, um, enter a space of a, of a foreign culture in Asia than it is in, in Europe, uh, I would say, or, or even the Middle East. I think there are a lot more uh, borders that you need to cross in order to get there to make it genuine and authentic. I think here in Asia, with all the different you know, uh, cultures around us, especially in Southeast Asia, um, uh, there's so much to explore, and I think the, the, the bridges are easier to cross and, and connect um, you know, not always in a in a um, you know charitable way, but also also in a fun way. And uh, I, I was just thinking about an experience I personally had when I had the privilege of staying at uh, at Nihi with uh, with James McBride, who's in the in the audience. You know, we we went to a, to a school and um, and we played football with the kids, and that was an experience that had nothing to do with charity or whatever. You know, we we, we brought the balls, we brought the gloves, and you know, just spending these 15 minutes, you know. Uh, playing with with little you know Zumbanese children, football was amazing, and I I felt genuinely happy, and and I hope the kids did too because they scored a few goals against us. So, but that's a, a fun experience. Yeah. Right? Did they win? They did. <laughs> <laughs> we had an Italian goalkeeper. <laughs> I mean, that's a great example of, of of really kind of understanding where you are and respecting the culture, right? Because each of us in this industry go to these remote places and we set up businesses, we have to be very aware the key stakeholders are the, the local inhabitants, not, not the people we parachute in for a year or two who, who manage these properties and bring in guests who stay a week. You know, the key stakeholders are the, the locals and you have to find a way of, of respecting their culture, of making sure that, that whatever you do is inclusive of them. And you've got to understand there are going to be winners and losers in the equation and you've got to try and balance that, right? Because in, very often you come in and you're spending millions of dollars in these uh, uh, remote places where, in reality, you know, their, their lifestyle is a million miles from what your, your, your guests you parachute in are, are doing there. So I think it, it's just a question of managing that in the, in the most respectful way you possibly can. And being aware, your key stakeholders are the guys on the ground. You know? That's how you're going to make your business last 50 years. Otherwise, you're going to be there in three years, and the villagers are going to be up in arms, and you know, nobody's going to come and stay with you. Yeah. Um, who is this person who comes in and parachutes? Do you, each of you feel like you have the same sort of client profile? Um, and I'm talking about, you know, country, city of origin, um, age range. Um, who is your sort of... I, I don't think you know, that each of us looks at a typical traveler nowadays, you know. Travel is global nowadays. If you had said in the 80s, the rise of Japan, now people talk about the rise of the Chinese traveler. But in reality, each of us targets a global customer, you know, a global guest. It's not, I don't really kind of go to a location and say, oh, I'm going to target a Chinese guest on an age range of 35 to, to 25 because that's optimal. You know, I think, I think you might do that in very specific circumstances where you have lots of tour groups or, thing, or something. But, but really kind of the hospitality industry is very much a global game nowadays and you try and, and make sure that you are adapted to that global game. But there are very few hotel groups, I would say, that, that target just a specific um, demographic or specific um, 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 type of traveler. So, yeah, it's true. I, you know, Lose, what Lowe says is quite true because the world has changed so much that uh, for us, in order to handle all the different various customers, it's creating itinerary that are customized. And in that sense, you know, you, you, uh, anyone is welcome. And for any clientele, any guest of any age who wants to book with us, they feel comfortable, there's something for them. And that's, I think, uh, our target is, is to, to have an, a broader customer of different you know, age and genders and 
yeah, nationality. I think none of us in a, is in a position currently uh, to to limit access to our products or our brands. Um, you know, through saying I'm only going to look after the Chinese customers, or only the European, or or only the top end. I think we all have to to realize that. Um, we are out there for everybody. The distribution landscape is massive. Yeah, everybody knows about us who would like to know about us. Yeah, it's, I think, really up to us then to determine, OK, um, what is our price point you know, for a, a certain customer to, uh, to experience you know, a stay at a Capella or at a Belmont or on a cruise ship? Yeah, and then what, what do we do with this price point to, to create that experience yeah, uh, without, without diluting, diluting the brand? Um, just, I guess, does that make it more challenging, though, to, to, to satisfy like, such a diverse set of people um, who, as you said earlier, bring different expectations of what an authentic uh, vacation is? Uh, I know like tourism to New York, for instance, there's a, there's a totally different experience uh, for someone visiting New York from Hong Kong um, than, than you'd offer someone visiting from, from even London. So um, do you feel like you create itineraries or sort of look to the interests of, of how do you cater to people very specifically and yet <laughs> you know, be broad enough to welcome the world, well, I, I guess I is my question. I think people like choices. Okay. So what we do is we offer that. You, when you book a cruise or a stay at a hotel, especially where what we offer is experience, it's, the experiences needs to have options and lots of uh, customization and we ever evolving. But the nicest thing, and I see people appreciate the most, and customer likes this now, is that they, they are able to choose and it's not a standard itinerary that they, were, they have to do. You know, there are bound to be things in itinerary that are set that people don't like. And what we have done is that we have created itineraries that cater for everyone. You choose or the, the type of uh, activities and sightseeing that suits you, that you like to be involved with. Uh, we ensure that the, uh, the support team, the guides uh, that are full-time with us are trained in all these various different activities. And obviously, some are good at certain areas, so we sort of specialize in it. So we've, we sort of locate those guides to cater for those experiences. But at the end of the day, people like to have the option of the choice. I like to be able to choose what I want to do. And most people doesn't even know what they want to do until they got on board. And that's the nicest thing is that we will be able to offer that to them after they've come on board and, and sort of settled in and then worked out what they want to do. And sometimes families split up, friends split up to different things and they get what they want at the end of the day. This is where, where I think luxury comes in and you know, as authentic luxury. In addition to choice, we need to offer time to our guests. I think very often when you stay in hotels, everybody is so busy with everything else except looking after the customer. Yeah, and um, everything is scripted, everything is, is policies and procedures. They have to exist, otherwise we can't run a business. But I believe we, we have opportunities in, in really spending more quality time with our customers, sit down, understand what they would like to, to learn about the destination, and then be with them on the journey. Um, if, if we don't have time and the customer feels, well, I can only do this from two to four, but I really want to do it after dinner, you know, then he's most probably at the wrong place because that's what we should be able and providing. Do that experience when you want to do it. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was young and I traveled, and again, was maybe at a different price point as well, but, you know, the first thing you get when you get into hotel, there's the tour desk and somebody is grabbing you like a shark and say, this is what you, you want to book a horse ride, you want to book this, you want to book this. So, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. At that time, I liked it. It was cool because it was at a discount. Yeah, but that was a different, <laughs> different, um, you know, era, I guess. And if we were to repeat this today, um, everything will go wrong from there. We can't. And, and I, I, I agree with that. You know, look, at the end of the day, what we do is difficult. And and if we didn't do it well, none of us would be existing. None of us would be on this stage. So inevitably, you know, the customization that's required now for the luxury traveler is difficult. You know, but there are many ways of doing it. <clears throat> 
sometimes they can they can tell you what they want. You know, at our hotels, actually, we have a person who Google's every guest who comes in. We are small enough to be able to do that. You know, and then we put a you know in, in Old Clare, you'll see that they they put a, a little picture frame with a social media picture that that person might have posted from a few days ago. So the guest comes in, he sees a familiar picture, a, a posting he might have done on Instagram or Facebook or something. You know, we do it obviously on public platforms. We're not stalking people. You know, and, and you have a little you have a little word of, of something you might find out what their favorite car is or their favorite color, and you do something that customizes it. So it's a it's a little personal touch. You don't want to go too far down the road and, and, and get the person nervous about whether or not you're stalking him. But in, in reality, everyone posts so much things about all the things they do, and they make it very public, that you know, you're at liberty to look at a little bit of that and, and see whether you can tease out something that's a little bit, going to be a little bit fun, a little bit irreverent, you know, never take themselves too seriously. And so there, there are many ways you know, uh, hotels like ours can, can, can really kind of make the experience a little bit special a little bit more customized, find out what they want ahead of time. Um, you know, 11 Madison Street in New York is famous for it. They Google every customer, right? You know, so so they, and they, they customize a dish for that customer. So I think that all of us in this travel uh, industry, which we term luxury, we have literally the luxury of, of going that little bit of extra mile. And it is difficult, but you have to do it. Otherwise, what's your differentiator? You, I, we wouldn't exist. Um, that's great. Now I'm going to really pay a lot of attention to my online presence before I book with you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, that's it for me. At this point, I should open it up to questions. I would like to refer to the earlier discussion that you have actually made a point about curating bespoke and customized experiences from within the hotel industry itself. Uh, would that mean that you are insinuating that there would be a potential shift of aspiring travelers moving away from destination management companies directly to hotels. If that's a shift, that would be question number one. Question number two, I, I'm very envious with Andrea's uh, feedback with regards to uh, bringing footballs uh, to the community to have a game and all that. Uh, does that represent that there is a growth in socially responsible luxury travel? And if there is in the horizon, how would one be able to balance or strike the right equilibrium of luxury travel versus um, the community or the, uh, the village of not feeling that they are just a commodity in that sense? The, the, the partnership that we as hoteliers have with the DMCs will, will continue to be there. Um, it is a, a necessity to operate in certain destinations uh, where we need DMC expertise to execute uh, programs and itineraries. Um, where I think where we need to see a shift maybe is about what kind of itineraries we can do together for our clientele. You know, when you look at um, you know, travelers that are booked, for example, through the Virtuoso networks or through FHR, may not be the travelers that you know, would like to hop on a bus that we then book through a, a DMC, um, if that makes sense. Uh, I think that the relationship will continue to be there. Um, we may require some fine tuning. And again, it comes back to working together for, for a common cause, and that meaning creating uh, something that, that is unique and authentic for the guests, who at the end of the day execute it, whether it is one of our personal assistants who goes with the customer on that journey through that village, or whether it is a, a highly experienced and trained local tour guide that works for one of the DMC, to me, you know, is both, both can work, I guess. And on the football question, um, well, it goes into, into uh, you know, community and, uh, and social responsibility. That was just one example that I personally enjoyed uh, tremendously. Um, I believe that our clients currently and maybe more so in the future um, um, are very much aware of challenges that are um, present in the destinations where we operate, especially in Southeast Asia, and they tell us we want to be part of that. So you as a provider need to make sure that you understand that and you have something in place to let that customer experience um, something that is very local and that supports um, a common cause in, in the destination uh, we operate. A very close uh, cousin of, of those subjects is sustainability too, right? Every customer who travels, particularly in the segment we're talking about luxury, 
is interested in also sustainability, not just the cultural aspect of where they are and how, how well integrated they are with the community. So all of us in the industry, in this sector, are very aware of our responsibilities as stakeholders in, in kind of global climate change and, 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 and this is a topic that you know, will in, be in the next five years be even more important than it is now. With the first question in regards to DMC, it is a challenge. Uh, uh, in my uh, business, we always try and make sure that there is a balance that you struck with a partnership with DMC where they are and they do understand what your needs are. Uh, you know, our brand values very much focus on the experiences, the authenticity, the unique part of it, and we like everything to be you know, sort of customized and people have the choice. So the partnership has to be quite close enough to that. We would, they will be able to create and work with us itineraries, programs that works for them as well as for us. Uh, we also have the obviously the advantages in the sense that we do have uh, a complete set of uh, services available in Myanmar that provides tours and and as well as cruise ships and uh, the hotel. So we we actually do. Um, uh, share a lot of work with DMC on the ground, but we also do some of our work ourselves, which sort of makes it a lot easier in terms of in ensuring that all the experiences are syn synchronized. Uh, with regards to the concern of, you know, how would you balance the, you know, not commoditizing the village, uh, it's, it's quite tricky, and one needs to find a balance. So you need to know those villages well and you need to know, they need to understand, and so is the guest. So there's some sort of briefing that goes through so that both side of uh, uh, parties uh, would then have the better understanding of uh, what this is all about, and that the balance of the experiences will be on both sides, and not just the guests. Uh, villages welcome tourists, not for the fact that they could sell things to them, and we don't want that, uh, but the fact that they could share their experiences and the nicest thing you will ever see is that when someone sits down in the village, do nothing, a, a, a guest, and then surrounded by friendly villagers, and they just talk and try and talk. And that's, that's, that, that's the sense that I felt uh, the guests appreciate the most, being able to communicate with the locals and see how is it like, their life as it is. One of the most simple, successful, our experiences we have shared with a guest is that we have someone to translate and all the guests do was talking to the locals and they walk away so happy the fact that they are able to communicate with, uh, with the locals when we do the market tours we don't do the market tours anymore where it's sort of setups and you buy food the day before we do a briefing and say like today we're going to learn a few words about Myanmar and, and numbers because the chef wants to do this recipe and this is the amount of money you have left to, to spend on it and tomorrow we'll take you to the market and you need to buy all these ingredients from any shops but these are the ingredients we need, these are the money that's available so the interaction starts and this is where the bargaining would start and the, the guests would have this you know, friendly exchange of experience with the, with the, with the locals and I think that's, that's important and they, the guests walk away really happy the fact that they got what they needed they shop. and the, the, the vendors, the sellers walk away really happy that they have this nice interaction with a foreign person that it's not a daily thing to them on, on the point of sustainability, if I, if I may just uh, make one last comment. You know, when, when you talk about travel, it's all about a destination, but it's also about a journey that, that starts way before you reach the destination. And I think when you talk about sustainable tourism, that journey should not finish when you leave the destination. So it should continue because if you say, well, I've done my part now of sustainability, I've spent a shitload of money there and I helped some locals and now I go back to my own life, I think then we have failed as providers. I think if we are able to allow our customers to continue to be part of that journey, whether it is through social media, uh, through updates, um, maybe even convince them to come back to a destination and continue what they have started at some time, I think that is successful, sustainable tourism. You know, if, if they leave and then that's it, and you know, I, I think we, we, we need to go back to the drawing board. I'd like to thank you guys for being here. It's really a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.